Grounded Goal Setting. Well, good morning, church. One thing I find that is interesting in the church calendar, it seems that September is usually the start, as it's the start of the school year, it seems to be the start of the ministry year of a church, where a church plans out uh, the fall activities leading into Christmas, and then over the winter leading into Easter, and then usually with some sort of VBS or summer thing, and then things piddle out for some vacation time, only for us to ramp back up again in the fall. And so now that we are here now on the 10th of September, and we are gonna be grounded in our goal setting, for us as a church and us as individuals as we seek to honor God in this day and age. I'm going to teach to you today out of the entire chapter of Romans 12 on how we can live our day-to-day -day lives to set proper goals to live the Christian life so that others may know that Jesus lives and that Jesus loves them. It is the purpose of the church to be the hands and feet of Jesus Christ. And we all have varied gifts to be able to do things differently but together in unity and equality. Now further, this is also back to school Sunday. All the kids are going back to school this week and we are just uh, excited for them as they grow. Uh, as we know, we've all been through school at one point in our lives and we understand that the limited stressors uh, and goal setting that happens in the physical world produces a harvest. We know that if we can push kids a little bit, but maybe not too far to break them, they learn and they grow. And as they learn new things, they start to exercise their brain, they make decisions and then they go. So here's what is interesting to a minor, someone who is not yet an adult, most of the goals in their life are dictated to them by other people. For example, you are going to go to school and you are going to get good grades and you have the goal setting being tended to by parents and teachers. And of course that is appropriate because they're just kids. And so it's important on us to train a child in the way that they should go, not just in scriptures, but here in the world. And I think that it is interesting that as we, uh, I'm going to be doing some comparisons here of, of the physical and then the spiritual disciplines that we have. We understand in the world that different children learn different ways. And we understand that uh, some children are more active than others. Some are more interested in humanities and how people feel and how people are doing. Where others are quite mechanical and they like to see how things work and how they're fixed. Others are natural leaders where they just know how to get the something done and help people to get to where they need to go. And others are just faithful servants who just are happy to go along with the crowd and work hard along the way. And so if we understand that within a school system, and we know that a teacher needs to teach all these children in a different way in order for them to learn these different subjects, all of it helps them to grow. But we know we need to adapt to help each individual person. Further than that, it's important that there is a, a plethora of different educational devices that are out there. And there's a, a reason for that is because, well, we may not have the current school system or one particular school might not have uh, it dialed in for each student. You know, we're always learning about how to educate and how to educate different kinds of people better. This is why I think it's great that we have uh, principals and teachers that have different freedoms between school to school within uh, a framework to be able to try something new. We have uh, competition between provinces, you know, as education is a provincial matter, not a federal one, then it's like, well, what are they doing in this province that's better than what we're doing here? What can we learn from each other? Then there's homeschooling. There's things that are a strong benefit to homeschooling and there's things that are drawbacks. Well, then there's also things that when we look at, um, we have private schools as well. So all these different things uh, really show a competition, if you will, on who's a better educator. We can all learn from each other. This is why I believe that freedom in education is important. And so we see that when having good goals and good outcomes with children when that does happen. We then also recognize by the time you've become an adult, you've realized, yes, everything that I was taught in school was useful. You may not be using it as you so think. And I think it's interesting that people say, how come I wasn't taught this in school and why was I taught that? When am I ever going to use this in real life? I can't remember how many times I would have said that as a child and you probably said the same thing. But what, one thing that would have been helpful for me to know then, so it's gonna be helpful for you to know now and to also to tell your children, all education is exercising your brain. All education is important because even if you don't think you have a particular use for it, you're still uh, adapting and putting things into your brain that might be used in another way somewhere else. And uh, further than that, it, it also teaches us to be able to uh, hunker down and to get educated on matters that we really don't enjoy. Now, uh, we know that when there's an interest involved, and if we want to learn algorithms or teach children who love video games algorithms, you could, you could uh, teach, uh, use video games to help those children learn those techniques. We understand those things. 
But if we only teach in a way that the child prefers, then when adversity comes to them in the future, they will expect it to adapt to them versus them to be able to grab the bull by the horns and get it done. So uh, to learn what we may never use is important for two reasons. We gotta be able to do things and learn and tackle things that we are not interested in or actually maybe even disinterested in. And then on top of that, we need to be able to, uh, you know, have an attention span going beyond that, but then realizing that we are gaining from that. We know this also in sports. We try to raise our children in this church and in this community uh, to be healthy, to eat proper foods. We just don't tell children to follow their nose. If they did, they would just eat nothing but sugar and bad food all the time. And though that might satisfy them in the moment, we know that's going to lead to many knock-on effects throughout the rest of their life and challenges to their health and to their own goals that they might have with their physical body. It might limit them on the sports they want to play in the future. So we need to have a wisdom, a wise outlook to say, how can we help these children to be strong so that they live long and healthy lives? We all understand all that I had just said. And, but what I find quite interesting is how many people do not value spiritual growth. I'm not talking about just within my church because I know my church family it loves the Lord and it's trying. And, but as this is here today is to help to teach you how to teach spiritual growth to your world because the world around you needs to know that you love Jesus. And today we're gonna teach and try to help give you some tools to be able to help that. So back to teaching your own kids about a recap of just a few things. You want to set some goals for your kids, but at a point in time, you're gonna to wanna to help them to set their own goals of what they want to do and how they wanna go about it and help them to find, to become thinkers, to become researchers. How can I find what I want? So then how do I backtrack that goal from where I am now? both in intellect, education, uh, physicality, and other arts interests. So I just want to encourage you in that, is switch from being their goal maker to helping them to learn how to make goals and to think for themselves. Because ultimately you can train somebody to do a task, but the second you can teach someone how to think for themselves, um, you've solved a lot more problems. And that's one thing that I wish we would train a little bit more in our own public school system, is teaching students how to think and how to research what knock-on effects may be. Because there's lots of great ideas that are floating out there that someone says, why doesn't the government just do this? Or why doesn't this church just do that? And, but they don't know all the other considerations that it in fact on balance is a bad decision. And, but they can't see the bad because they can only look at the good. It is often why younger naive people make um, bad judgments when it comes to picking uh, romantic partners and why you need people who have been there and done that to say, you know what, this person, I know you, I know you're smitten with them, but they've got a bunch of red flags that you are just so unaware of. But often young people don't listen because all they can see is the good. And so this is why it's important for us to help them to make their own goals, but help them to think and to see a broad uh, spectrum of everything that they are going to encounter and how to investigate. And this is why even in this church, I will not do a wedding unless I do premarital counseling with that couple first. Not that I'm ever gonna refuse someone uh, a wedding or whatnot, but my point is this, is I like to stress test them because I always say to them in the first session, uh, you don't need me for you two to fall in love with each other. You guys have already done that. But you need someone like me who has compiled the research to be able to help you to navigate this, to find out the red flags, the things that you don't see. And are you willing to pay the price? Because when you make a commitment in marriage, it's a significant deal and I have to walk them through that. I'd be, I'd be irresponsible if I didn't. We know how important and how deep marriage is and how could we allow some young people to go off and get married without having them to understand how they're going to build their life and interact with the rest of their, uh, their extended families, holidays, things like that. So now let's get on to spiritual matters. We know that as the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are all the same substance, God, they all are distinct in their personality and what they do. In the same way, we do have a body and a spirit, and they are, have the, we have this dual thing. Some people think only in the flesh, other people think only in the spirit. And I'd really like to encourage you that I don't think that God made there to be such a divide as the world does it. I think we need to be walking in spirit and in truth every moment. So all of those physical things we talk about are amazing, but they are also very closely related to how we approach the spiritual world and our spiritual growth. Consider that uh, all the different types of people in the world exist in their educational ways, what helps them to learn, what doesn't, what, and what their aptitude would be for a particular job. So it's true when it comes to spiritual matters. This is why we learn that there is a plethora of gifts that the Holy Spirit gives. We have a equality through, through um, unity, not an equality through outcome. 
all of us are going to be different. In fact, from what we will end up doing and who we will be in the church or in school or wherever, there are differences among us. So we are not equal as an outcome of what ends up, but we are equal in the unity in the value through Jesus Christ. This is why the Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians 12, how can the eye say to the ear, I have no need of you? It's ridiculous for us to rank different people. We are equal before the cross. We are equal in unity as together we make up one body, one society, if you will, to get the job done. And again, we understand that we need to have engineers and we also need to have garbage people. We need to have mail delivery service and we need to have doctors. You know, we need lots of different things and all of those need to function. I, I always retort back when I hear uh, stats on, you know, Canada is doing uh, fourth in high school math, you know, and I'm thinking like, well, we don't need 30 million engineers. Um, we need some good smart engineers and we are producing really smart engineers but it's not something that's an interest to most Canadians. So that kind of, that's what throws us down the ranks. It isn't that we're not producing good engineers. We just don't need to produce 30 million of them. So when you say that we're falling behind in test scores in a particular uh, area, we need to ask more questions than that, saying, do they need more funding to help get the kids up to that? Or is it that like, well, we have enough engineers. So guess what? We could use some more doctors. So if we're falling behind in med school enrollment, well, yeah, then we should probably look at that in their scores. You get what I'm saying there. Translate that over to the church. The church has a variety of different gifts. The same way as we need all the jobs that are out there for our society to function, we need all the jobs and gifts within a church to operate in order for this society called the church body to be able to operate and to carry the head that is Jesus Christ. He's routinely referred himself to, he is the head of the church. He's the one that sets the direction. He's the one that gives us our identity in him. He is the one who helps us to understand where we're going and what we're doing. And then the body supports all of that, whether it's the fingers, the eyes, the nose, whatever you can imagine that you are. And all of them are needed. You know, we have some people that we just celebrated a baptism yesterday. And though I'm the pastor, I'm the one out there kind of doing the dunking. You know, we had all kinds of people working behind the scenes to work the barbecue, to uh, help set up and tear down, and just to help make sure everything was okay and that, you know, nothing, anything that was broken was cleaned up before a child stepped on something. And we had a beautiful picnic out at the lake and uh, celebrate these baptisms as well. You may have people just being there ready to prayerfully give people their towel when they get out of the, out of the, the water. And so with that, I just want to encourage you that every gift needs to happen. I get to see that as a pastor, but do you, do you know how much goes on in the run of a church, in the run of a week? And it's all about family and it's about society and how we interact with each other and how God wants us to interact with each other. And so there's other people behind the camera here right now that are making this available to you, uploading it to computers. Multiple people are working on this so that we can bring this word of God to you. So as complex as society is and our education system that has a purpose and end goal for us to find an aptitude and a career, so in the same way that God has saved us to be a part of his plan, that not only will we have a job in the world, but we'll have a job in his church and it will be glorious. It's a privilege to be able to serve the Lord. Like what else could possibly be better than serving the most powerful, smartest, awesomest being that has ever lived? It's why I love ministry and I love serving with people. And it's a great time. And so as much as there's textbooks in school to help people to find those end goals, I want to help you to find and give some practical ways of how can we set godly goals so that we can be our unique person who is equal but different in the body of Christ as we relaunch ministries this fall and see that the gospel that has come to us goes out from us. Romans chapter 11 or chapter 12 here has um, some of the most condensed. Here's how you live. Here's how you set goals. First is you need to determine to follow Christ, to trust him as your savior. That is the beginning of salvation. The next is God, give me a willing spirit to want to follow your desires and your statutes. Then the third is starting to learn those through Bible study and meeting with other people and then putting them into practice. Just like any sports thing, you go learn about it and then you start to go do it and practice and then you go into the real game. And so this is why we get people to, different people to read scripture at church. I'm trying to get people to be able to use their voice in a public setting because God might have a voice for them somewhere else to share the gospel. And why we have different gifts, sharing testimonies and things like that is we need to exercise and practice. And church is often a practice for many people using their gifts of various forms. So when we go out into the rest of our world, people will know and see that we are skilled in what we are doing and they will see the value of uh, faith.
Because I got to tell you this, this is one of the reasons why I'm asking you to set a godly goal for your spiritual growth, to make a determination to, I'm going to orient my life around the gospel of Jesus Christ, is because most people in this city uh, and in the Western world are familiar with the name of Jesus Christ. In fact, they'd be familiar, most people would be familiar with the phrase, the Ten Commandments. They might be, uh, you know, as things go on, it, it might get less and less. But there's a fair amount of cursory Bible knowledge from a lot of people. Now that dwindles as people get young because people are not being raised in church anymore, which by the way, tells you the value of the church because even people who are baby boomers or Generation X that grew up in church, they know a lot about the Bible. They just don't go to church anymore. And you ask them, where did you learn this? It was Sunday school and it was at church. It goes to tell you the value of the church that exists to train young people to know what the word says. But what I find interesting is even when people know a fair amount about the Bible, uh, there still seems to be this disinterest in church by a lot of people. Again, the majority of people don't go to church ever. And uh, a great number of people uh, treat it as just a secondary thing that I'll go when I feel like it. It most certainly does not feel like it is something that they've dedicated their lives to the ministry of Jesus Christ and want to work with a team to see God's glory go out in the earth. I run into people all the time that go, I can pray from home. I don't need to go to church to believe in God. And I'm thinking like, yeah, but you need to, you need to be a part of a church, the mission somehow, whether it's a home church or, or otherwise. Uh, yes, you can pray at home. No one ever said you couldn't. Yes, you can read your Bible at home. But who's your team that you're doing it with? Because a bunch of ears can't do a whole lot other than listen. But to get to hear in action and to put it in an action needs a whole body. And so I often will dig a little bit deeper because I grew up not in the church. And then when I came to the church, I just loved it. So I don't understand this idea of having this in and out you know, relationship with the church. Maybe you can help me out. Tell me your story. Tell me understand what goes on in some people's heads when, they, when I, th I think like, well, you're supposed to be a part of your own healing and your own growth. And often I'll hear things like, uh, church is boring. Um, you know, some people argued at church once. So it's like, how is the love of Christ in them? Or whatever else negative may have happened. Uh, it just, it breaks my heart that people have withdrawn uh, so quickly over certain things. And I don't know what, really what they went through, so I can't make a judgment. I'm just saying it's sad. But I think that, you know, the Christian life is more than just praying at home. It is far more than just getting a verse here and a verse there and saying a prayer here and a prayer there. This is no less than your seminary. This body of believers, forget the building for a moment, the, the body of believers is where we train, is where we practice, it is where we find our gifts and use it and find our purpose. Because when we set a goal and we use it, it is well documented in psychology. It is well documented in the church. It is well documented in sports that when people make a goal and they take a step that's actually measurable to that goal, it makes them happy. We now understand through science that it makes a dopamine hit and it literally makes you happy. And this is why goal setting, why how many people, even in scripture, uh, so what else is going on in the spirit? I don't know. It's a dopamine hit. You just feel the, the presence of the Lord, which then again makes you feel wonderful. This is why people were able to hit the goals in the Bible, even though their physical surroundings were painful. They knew they were advancing the gospel and that was their goal. So even when they faced headwinds, when they faced persecution, and when they faced even beatings, they were happy because they're reaching their goal. I got to tell you this, I'm not telling you to chase happiness by setting a goal, I'm just saying that this is an outcome of setting the goal. Again, I never like to try to like dangle carrots to try to get people to go, you know, it's God. I mean, we should want to follow him, but I'm just kind of explaining here a bit that, that you know, it will make you happy. You set a godly goal that's legit um, and you make any kind of uh, advancement towards that. And when you see that happen, it's gonna make you happy. And guess what? We live in the most unhappy of times. We've never had more and yet we've never felt more depressed or anxious than ever. And I do believe that there is a very big spiritual sickness in this world because of apathy, because of, I can just do that whenever at home. I don't really need. So it makes me wonder, why do people think that the church is not of value, meaning the, the gathered body of believers? Has ministry, have these people experienced ministry so poorly that the body was unable to do anything? That in a sense, their body was in a coma and so they don't see the value. So how do people know about God and know that there's got to be some sort of mission related to God, but yet then don't engage in it and are very apathetic towards it? Now, I know you could go on and say, well, it's their own hearts that needs to deal with things. 
But here's some feedback that I'd like to get from you. Is why do you think some people know a fair amount about God, but yet do not see the value in participating in a local gathering of Christians? This is a code I'm wanting to crack. And if you can help me with either your story or with what you've observed, then that will help us to be an effective church. Because I want it to be effective. We, we never change the gospel, but we'll change our methods to try to help people. And part of this is spurred by, I had a conversation with a gentleman a couple of weeks ago, and he highlighted the fact that many people know much about the Bible. And where we put a great deal of our resources into outreach and letting people know about Jesus, uh, he criticized the church's effort to do that, saying if they, if they wanted to know, there's churches on every corner, if they want to know about God, they could just go. And I'm thinking, like, well, that's kind (laughs) of flippant of you. I mean, people need to, you know, there's churches all around me when I was growing up, but yet they were always seemed to be closed. I never met somebody. You know, Sunday mornings, everything was closed back in those days on Sundays, so I slept in watching or watched cartoons. I never walked by or drove by uh, parking lots full on a Sunday morning to know that there was signs of life in a church. But just walking to school in mornings and afternoons, usually churches aren't very exciting-looking places. And sometimes I think in my own life, as I came to faith, it was because I had the opportunity to ask questions when I ran into a professed Christian. And they looked like they believed. Because, well, you know what? The Christians that I had run into that said they were Christians, first of all, it seemed like anybody who was a Christian just didn't care much that they were. And then I ran into somebody who I believed they believed and that they had orientated their life based upon it. And they would move anything in their life that God wanted. Just, they, just, they just radiated this, this idea of they just wanted to follow God. And it intrigued me because I'd never seen someone like that before. Everybody else that I had known was materialistic. What's in it for me? Not what can I give up so I can follow God more? And that, honestly, was a moment that made me say, I need to find out about this God. And that's what brought me to the scriptures. And I said, well, how do I know this faith is real? So then I went and got a Quran and a Book of Mormon and a few others and reading. So, you know, there's something unique about this Jesus. Nobody else ever died for my sins. Nobody else ever did it without demanding something in return. Like, we can't earn our salvation. It's a free gift from Jesus. And it's simply God offering us to come back and to be with him. But that he's also going to make us holy because he is holy. So he accepts us for where we are, but he transforms us into something greater. And it would break my heart to know that we didn't use all of our effort to reach out to our community to help those to see the value of being a part of the church body. To understand the church is a place where we can grow, where we can make really good friends, to make good choices, so that we can find our identity in him, our purpose in life, and it will help us to grow and to be able to face the challenges that we uh, have in this world. And when we face those challenges knowing we just want to serve God well, then you know what? I believe that other people will see there's value to being a part of a Christian community. And there's value to loving God. He does, in fact, love us back. We want to train people how to pray and how to prophesy, how to hear from the Lord. And we want to train people how to do good works and whatever that may be. And so just as we're getting near the end of this, I just want to read to you Romans chapter 12. And to see that this is God's desire. The Holy Spirit has inspired the Apostle Paul to write this to the Romans. Paul had never been to Rome. He had heard that there was a Christian community there. So he wanted to make sure that they understood good doctrine and good Christian living. And much of the, of the book of Romans up till now has been on great doctrine. It's the biggest, best piece of theology we have in the Bible, to be honest with you. But then he ends it with, and this is why you do it. And this is how you should go about it. Because we know the old adage, nobody cares what you know until they know that you care. Well, there is a countenance that goes along with the Christian as we work together. So let's read chapter 12 in totality, and I'll see what the Lord's speaking on your heart as I read this to you. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true act of proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. For by the grace given to me, I say to every one of you, don't think of yourselves more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith that God has distributed to each of you. For just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we, though many, form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. We have different gifts according to the grace that is given to us. If your gift is prophesying, 
then prophesying in accordance with your faith. If it is serving, then serve. If it is teaching, then teach. If it is to encourage, then give encouragement. If it is giving, then give generously. If it is to lead, then do so diligently. If it is to show mercy, do it cheerfully. Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil, cling to what is good. Be devoted one to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor, serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer, share with the Lord's people who are in need, and practice hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice, and mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge, and I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing so, you will reap burning coals on his head. And do not become overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. So as you can see, you know, we have a lot of different ministries in this church from Bible studies, men's, women's, children's, youth ministries. You know, we have different outreaches that we do. We have cleaning teams. We've got building vision teams. We have elders. We have uh, administrators, AV techs, worship team. We've got all kinds of different things that we do together that makes each other's work more effective. We've got people that give and that work out accounting, and if they didn't do that, we wouldn't have the, the ability to pay the bills to be able to have the lights on and cameras rolling. And so as we use all of our gifts together, you know, we, we have all these unique things. We have many parts, as it says here, but for the one goal of lifting Jesus higher. And we do that by being loving him sincerely and loving others. So let that be our first goal going into the fall of 2023 is, Lord, we want to dedicate our lives to you. And we want to set the goal of dedicating our lives to you and dedicating our lives to one another as Romans chapter 12 commands us to do. And that as we do so, that may our world, as we depart from here and go out and live our lives, may we live in such a manner that people look into our lives and say, these people believe, I'm intrigued. And at that moment, it will give us an opportunity to share the gospel, the same one that we preach relentlessly, so that people will know that they can always turn to their God. Because God made the world perfect. Humanity botched it. But God made the fix through his son, that those who would believe in him would not perish but have eternal life. He proved the power over life and death by being executed falsely, <laughs> taking our sins on him, and then raising by his own power in three days. To ascend into heaven, being witnessed to by hundreds, and giving his Holy Spirit in the church age to his people that have continued to bring the gospel down from generation to generation till we have it here today. And then we'll get to live with him forever in heaven once the clock has run out here on the earth. So I pray that as you go today, that you would find a uh, beautiful church family if you haven't already, that you would lean in to find out what your gifts are because a church is uh, much like the rest of the world. It's a place for education. It's a place for making great friends. It's a place for connecting with God. It's a place for practicing your skills, uh, uh, spiritual skills, and then using those for God's glory in the church and in your world. And I pray that as you do that, then God will be glorified and the people in this world will say, there is a reason to be a part of a church family. Well, thank you for tuning in. God bless you. Have a great day. Let's do something together. Life is better in community. So let me encourage you to reach out to us via the Connect card that you'll see in the description at the bottom of this video. That's your opportunity to just say hi, let us know you're watching. Let us know how we can be praying for you. Or maybe you have some questions about faith, about our church, um, or about life in general. We're here to help you and we're happy to do so. I'd also like to thank those who are faithfully giving. I can't express my thanks enough. We're able to continue ministry in our community and abroad um, so wonderfully because of your faithfulness of giving the Lord's tithes and your offerings. So to go above and beyond his tithes is just incredible. And so for those of you who uh, want to come and visit us, please know that our service is a gift to you. We never ask for anything uh, from our guests. 
As a Christian, it is my act of worship to give to the Lord, and each one of us Christians uh, believe that. So if you want to come check us out, there's no pressure, just come on over. Uh, if you did want to give, we have simple ways. Give at regalchurch.com for your e-transfer, no password required. You can drop it in the offering plate on Sundays, or you can drop through the to the office um, through the week. Just pop in, say hello, and uh, let us know who you are, and uh, we'd be happy to chat with you. Uh, we can also set up automatic deposit. We'll just send you the simple form, and you fill it out and send it back, and it's good to go. So thanks for your time, and God bless you. Thank you.